one of the things I used to do to pass the time is I would lay on my bunk and just brainstorm and daydream about different ideas or different things that I could possibly do when I was out. And then when I would settle on something I like, I would just jot it down. And then I would get super detailed because again, I have time. So I would, I would draw out, you know, basically make my business plan, you know, how much I'm going to sell it. I would get into the details of like pricing, how much I want to sell it for, how many employees I'm going to hire, um, where's, what, how much square foot of a building I need. And some of these things I didn't know the answer, but I would make assumptions. And, but going through this mental exercise, uh, basically building businesses in my mind uh, from start to finish, this gave me a lot of exercise that, so that when I was released and I actually did it in the real world, it didn't feel like the same. It didn't feel like the first time. It, it felt like I had been rehearsing this and rehearsing this and rehearsing this over and over and over again because that was like my that was like one of my outlets, right? So you know, just noticing, and I would just walk around the compound and I would see people complain about their mail or lack of mail or lack of communication or expensive for the phone calls, and I would just jot that down. It's like, hey, if I was going to solve this problem, what would I do? And then go through that whole exercise. I would see people complain about you know their family members having issues with finding housing and real estate. And I said, okay, if I was going to solve this problem. How would I solve it? And then I would just do that over and over again. I would meet somebody. You would bump, you know, particularly in federal prison, you have a whole gambit of inmates, right? So it's not just dudes on the street. Like you have dudes from Wall Street, you have politicians, you have, you know, Fortune 500 company CEOs, you have the whole gambit in, in federal prisons, right? So also I would talk to a lot of different people and I would hear a lot of things and it would, it would get the wheels turning and you will learn. So basically I just turned my environment into um, somewhere for me to learn. And prison is like that for most people. Like most people I know, they're learning something. So it's either you're going to sharpen your, your skills and you're going to come out and, and, and be a better criminal, or you're going to sharpen your skills. You're going to come out and learn some, something else. So there's guys that, you know, I know guys that went in, came out, you know, certified electricians, certified plumbers, CDL licenses, they certify barbers, you know, so th- I've, I've seen, I've seen people come in and do one of those two things. Mm-hmm. And so, and it, just because there's a wealth of information that people have in there, people learn how to fix their credit. I mean, it's just, it's so, and you know, the culture in prison, part of the prison culture is people who have information, part of how they'll do their bid and how they get their time passed is that they'll teach information. So what I if I if I was a mortgage broker and I understand credit, I'll teach people how credit works. Or if I was a a a, 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 a CEO of a Fortune 500 company and I did tax evasion or some shit like that, I'll teach people how to use Excel. And it was things like that that people were spending time. And a lot of brothers was learning. A lot of brothers was really getting good information. And a lot of people that I knew that I knew that all out now, they're all doing well and they've learned something. They from trading to just all across the board, people was just learning stuff. So that's really how I spent my time. And I aligned myself with people who always, who also spent their time that way. And wasn't just, you know, watching TV or gambling or, you know, running cigarettes or weed or whatever. Um, you know, I just aligned myself with the people that was on that. And, you know, everyone is out doing their thing. Okay. I want you now, you get out. I want you to go a little bit into detail. Yeah. The problem. You kind of touched on it, the problem that you found that inmates were having on the inside. I want you to go a little bit deeper into what the problem was. And when you got out, how did you get to work on the solution? Yeah. So so the main problem that I noticed is that even in my personal experience, it was always a hassle for someone to write a letter because people on the outside, they're moving at the speed of light. Their mode of communication is texting and phone calls, emails. They're not handwriting letters. They don't have a time. A lot of times, you know, they're trying to take care of the household. The, the person that was the main breadwinner bread in the household, they're the one that's in prison. So they have more responsibilities. They're stressed out. They don't have time to do that. Um, and or on the phone systems, it was always super expensive. To make the phones. So it was always a financial issue and it was a convenience and time issue. Um, so, you know, I knew that someone can make an app that would make it easy for people just to be able to upload photos, have a print and a ship. I mean, Snapfish was a thing, Shutterfly was a thing. There's, there was companies out there that did this. No one just focused on this demographic. 
And also, no one really understood the needs of the demographic to make sure, for example, that the envelopes or the letters and all this stuff is done a certain way so that it doesn't pose a security risk. No one just focused on this demographic, right, to build a product that was specifically for this demographic. So, um, so when I got out, that's the thing that I said, you know what, I'm going to solve that problem. I had all these ideas. I said, you know what, this is the one that I feel like is the most tangible. This is the one that I can relate to the most. I'm going to pursue this. And that's what I pursued. So my ambitions in the very beginning was I just wanted a place where people can go on, on a website, they can upload a photo, they can hit the send button. I thought I was going to have a printer in the office that was going to print it and ship it and send it out. I didn't realize, I wasn't thinking about scale. I wasn't thinking about how big it would get. I wasn't thinking about those things. I was trying to think of the smallest components to be able to validate that my idea was real and to validate that people would pay for this if they had it. So because I was in a halfway house at the time, so in federal prison, once you're released, um, they send you to a halfway house. Which what, what year were you released? 2011. How old are you at the time? 28. Yeah, okay. 28. 28 years old, 2011, you get out, you go into the halfway house. Take it from here. Yeah, so get to the halfway house. And the rules at the halfway house is that you can only leave if you have a job. Um, and then you can only leave if you have a job, only leave, I mean, for the hours that you work. And you only can leave for a limited amount of hours. I think they give you like two, three hours a day to look for a job. Mm -hmm. They don't allow you to have a cell phone. And then at night, you're still locked in a dorm. It's like a dorm area with like six beds. Uh, and you're locked in that dorm area. They give you... They give you um, lunch and dinner every day um, and breakfast, you figure it out. So um, that's basically what the, the program that I was put in once, um, once, I, uh, once my census was done. And this is like true for any federal inmate. That's just how they do it. They want to get you in the community before they just throw you out the gates. So long story short, because I wanted to work on my business, I had to figure out how to hustle and get myself out the damn halfway house so I can work on it. So I got my co-founder Alfonso and I had him say he was hiring me on paper. And one of the things that they do and how the, 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 the business model for the halfway houses work is if you're working, I think it's like 20% or 30% of whatever your check is, you have to pay to the halfway house. So you have to give them a pay stub and then you have to give them a check or money order for 30% of whatever it is of that. So what I would do is I would have to make fake pay stubs and I would just get money orders for the 30% of what I, I said I was getting paid. And then I would do that. And that's how I was able to buy my way out the halfway house so I could work on the business every day. So I was in halfway house for six months. So basically during those six months, I went from getting released to getting the product built and getting our customers in that six month period. And why I was rushing in that six months is because I knew I had six months of not having any rent. I knew I had six months where I don't have to buy lunch or dinner. And to me, that halfway house was really my accelerator. It was like my incubator to really get the business off the ground while I didn't have a lot of the burdens that I would have had had I had to say, well, damn, I got to find someplace to live. I got to pay rent. I got to do that. So, so I knew I needed to get something popping in that six-month time period. So my, my strategy was I went online. I started Googling. Again, I didn't have no background technology. I'd never done that technology before. And I started Googling. And I found this website called Freelancer. And it said you can hire developers to do anything. So I went on there and I said, hey, this is what I'm trying to build. And I had a bunch of people respond. I went with the cheapest person. And it was a lady in Texas. And she was like, yeah, I can, I can help you do this. So I said, cool. And then I just went to friends and family, the people who knew me from the streets, and they just always believed. They knew that if I said I was going to do something, I was going to figure out I was going to do it. So I would get $500 here, $1,000 here, $800 here. And that's how I would pay this freelancer to get our first early version of Pigeon and Bill. Um, and then once we got there, then the rest is history. Okay. In six months' time, you're telling me you get out of prison, you're in a halfway house, you can only go out of the halfway house for a certain amount of hours per day. You use this time so wisely that you were able to create the first iteration of Pigeonly within six months? Yeah, it was it was it was a it was a it was a it was a rush thing. I mean, I just had a sense of urgency. Because, I'm asking you this because yeah. there there are people who have never been to prison. There are people with nothing but time on their hand, yeah, and can't get their businesses up and running in six months. Yeah. So your level of determination is fascinating to me. The the, the, the way that you were able to to 
use every second of every hour of every day to your benefit coming out of the system I just find that remarkable and I, and, and I got to give it up to you because there, there are free people who have been talking about an idea, talking about an idea, talking about an idea, and you speak to them a year later, two years later, three years later, and they, they barely even got an incorporation at this point. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.